Hello, a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on this week's show, inside Aleppo, residents are trickling into the ravaged city as reconstruction slowly gets underway. The team behind 3D printing for war victims. The engineers have been operating out of a small hospital in Jordan. Also coming up, rising Egyptian tennis star Yusuf Hossam and his struggle to secure sponsorship will bring you the 19-year-old's profile. We start with Syria, where the long and arduous process of rebuilding cities devastated by a six-year-old conflict is underway. Diptyka Laurent brings you the story of the residents of Aleppo returning to their unrecognizable homes. Aleppo's 300,000 residents are slowly returning to their homes. But there's little left of life before the war. One of the city's most cherished monuments, the Omeyyad Mosque, is a shadow of what it used to be. Metal scaffolding holds up unstable pillars, and the mosque is missing its 11th century minaret, which was blown up in 2013. Zakaria Komush is responsible for the first stage of reconstructing Aleppo's walled old city. The historic souks were the longest in the world. Now they're an abandoned labyrinth of hollowed out stalls. Entrances to the markets have been completely destroyed. We carried out a serious cleanup here because in some areas there were four feet of debris. We had to remove it all. Nothing was spared in Aleppo's war. An upmarket hotel and its pool are hard to recognize beneath the rubble and debris, while stone cobbled alleyways, once full of shops and passers by, are now a collapsed heap. This Aleppo businessman has cautiously returned home. With some hammering and a lick of paint, he's hoping to rebuild his shoe shop. It feels so good. I haven't seen my shop for six years. Come over here. There's nothing left. All my merchandise was destroyed. This shop cost me a fortune and I built up a good reputation. Now I don't have enough money to pay my staff. I have to start from scratch. For other shopkeepers, it's a time for mini reunions. How are you? I'm well. We're trying to repair my neighbor's bakery, but as you can see, it's not easy. UNESCO and other associations are taking part in the reconstruction of Aleppo's schools, businesses and homes, but residents here say they'll be the first ones to roll up their sleeves and start rebuilding, if only to breathe new life into their city, devastated by years of conflict. Next, we'll bring you the latest effort at rapprochement between the West Bank-based Palestinian Authority and the Hamas government in Gaza. And it may just be the most ambitious attempt since Hamas seized power of the coastal strip a decade ago. Here's Alexander Jennings. Smiles and handshakes between rival groups. Could this mark the beginning of Palestinian reconciliation? A hero's welcome as the Palestinian Prime Minister Rami Hamdallah crossed from the Fatah-run West Bank into the Gaza Strip to meet with leaders of Hamas, a decade after the rival group took control of the enclave. Conditions in Gaza have deteriorated since Hamas ousted the mainstream party Fatah from the Strip in 2007. Now, they're handing back administrative control to a unity government headed by the Fatah Prime Minister, a major concession of power and a key step towards Palestinian national unity. We came with instructions and supervision from President Mahmoud Abbas to announce to the world from the heart of Gaza that the Palestinian state cannot exist nor can it be established without geographic and political unity between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Let us close together the chapter of division with all its details and consequences. Starting out with good intentions, but reconciliation talks are at risk of being threatened by Hamas's unwillingness to disband its 25,000 strong military wing, which still exercises power in Gaza. A previous attempt, brokered by Egypt to bring the two factions together in 2011, has had little success. 
a history that doesn't seem to shake the two parties' optimism. We expect and hope that on Tuesday the government will carry out its tasks in the Gaza Strip, providing services to the people of the Strip and cancelling the measures taken by President Abbas recently against the Gaza Strip, and also transferring this positive atmosphere of reconciliation to the West Bank. Neighboring Israel is skeptical, however, saying that these reconciliation talks, like those in the past, will invariably break down. Four years ago, several young engineers from Jordan started making 3D prosthetics for war victims. Now backed by the French NGO Doctors Without Borders, the project has become an example of how 3D technology could be the solution to poor access to prosthetics, which is a reality around the world. Sylvain Le Petit reports from Jordan. The MSF Hospital in Amman is home to one of the world's most cutting-edge research programs. This little boy was born with a deformed arm. Today, he's at the hospital to try his first prosthetic limb, made with a 3D printer. The Franco-American team heading this project will now make the second arm in less than 24 hours. Yeah, if you can finish it tonight, then we'll yeah. have it printed. And we can send them to more, yeah. The two men have been experimenting with new techniques, like this portable scanner, for the past six months. The goal is to save time and money at each step of the manufacturing process. It would allow us to have a digital mold in less than 15 seconds on patients who don't move too much, instead of doing a plaster mold, which takes more time and is cumbersome. In just a few hours, the prosthetic limb is ready to be printed. The next day, they head to the Fab Lab, a 3D printing workshop located in the north of Jordan. Safa Herfat is a biomedical engineer and a professor at the University of San Francisco. He tests all the new materials to find the right balance between flexibility and strength. Who is the M1 so that if the child falls or so hits something, it won't break. So that According to him, the new technology offers incredible possibilities. It's particularly uh, revolutionary for prosthetics because now we can design everything to fit each patient and very low cost. All of these components together uh, require less than $20 worth of material. Savings in manufacturing time and cost will directly benefit those who need the limbs the most. This little girl outgrew a conventional prosthetic limb that cost around 2,000 euros. Thanks to the 3D printing technique, she will be able to change her prosthetic limb as her body grows. Yes. It's really good. It helps for everything. To go to school, to get dressed. MSF chose Jordan in order to develop technology that can help improve the living conditions of vulnerable populations. We're looking for prosthetic limbs that are fairly simple, easy to produce and to fix if there's any issue, so that it can match the needs of the regions in which we work. Soon, the team of researchers hopes to create a virtual library to make prosthetic limbs downloadable and printable from anywhere around the globe. Moving on to some sports news from the region, Egypt's Yusuf Hossam is the only tennis player in Africa and the Arab world on the world junior rankings. But the 19-year-old is struggling to find a sponsor to support his promising career. Youssef Hossam is one of Egypt's most promising tennis players. The 19-year-old is a three-time African junior champion, and today he's ranked number 22 in the under-20s ATP rankings. But to continue his career, he now needs sponsorship. The support provided by the Egyptian Tennis Federation is improving. They're starting to help us with airline tickets, accommodation and hotels. But that isn't enough. We need more money and more financial support to be on the same level as players who reach the top 50 or the top 100. In 2016, the Egyptian Tennis Federation gave him the equivalent of just 300 euros, far from the millions that the top players make. Sponsorship would enable him to take part in more competitions, to focus more on training and gain global recognition. Challenging for him now, I think it's... Uh 
in this support, in financial support, preparing him for, uh, for being uh, a star. He should have more support because uh, from what I can see and from my knowledge, I can say he can be one of the top 100 players in the world. Yusef has multiple titles in Egypt where the sport is mostly reserved for the wealthy. But in international competitions, he's frequently the only representative of the African continent. His one and only goal now is to do everything he can to climb into the world top 100. A feat not achieved by an Egyptian since Ismail El Shafai in the 1970s. We end this week's show with Saudi Arabia, where after a historic decision last week to lift the ban on female drivers, the first driving school for women has opened on a university campus. This after nearly three decades of campaigning. Prior to the decree, Saudi Arabia was the only country in the world to ban women from driving. But women in the conservative kingdom won't be able to get behind the wheel until June. Well, that's it for this edition of Middle East Matters. Do follow the show on Facebook, Twitter and podcast. Stay tuned to France 24. An image of India. This is Gonda, officially the country's filthiest city after coming last in a government survey of more than 400 urban zones. It is a really pathetic state of affairs. We've been rated as India's dirtiest, and you can see it's a perfect ranking. Just look around and see how awful it is here. Gonda scored badly in key areas such as sanitation, waste collection and infrastructure. Prime Minister Narendra Modi launched a mission to clean up India soon after being elected in 2014. But it doesn't look like that message reached here. People dump dead stray dogs and other dead animals here. The municipal workers just leave them, then they start to smell. So we have to cover them with soil ourselves. What else can we do? Local media say corruption and political bickering are to blame. Some, though, think it's not all bad. I feel it got branded the dirtiest because of a serious lack of cooperation and communication between the team that was sent here and the local officials. Gonda has been hit with cases of cholera linked directly to poor sanitation. The city is now hoping to outsource garbage collection to the private sector in a bid to rid itself of its unwanted title. Inside the Americas, presented by Jeannie Godula. From North America to the southern tip of Patagonia, join us for a look at the latest political, economic, cultural and social news from the Americas. Inside the Americas, on France 24 and France24.com.